Now our next guest is in the studio. The company formerly known as Toyota Kenya is now a new company called CFAO Motors. Of course, I know that we pronounce it a bit different and the uh, boss is here to tell us. The managing director of CFAO Motors Kenya Limited, <laughs> Avinda Singh Real, is here. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I've heard very many people call it in very many things. So I just wanted you to say it the way you say it. Others say it's CFAO, CFO, CFAO. What is it? It is actually CFAO, Motors Kenya Limited. Ah, yeah. nice. So you, you got it 100% right. So the one was right. <laughs> yes, you were 100% <laughs> right. <laughs> well done. Wow. Karibu sana to Kenya's biggest company. Asante. Thank you this very much. This is a big company now. You've also merged with a company formerly known as DT Dobby. You'll tell us more about this and everything else that's what's happening and looking at the future of the automotive industry in this country and things that uh, we ought to be thinking about. CT has the day's proverb. I do. Mm -hmm. uh, proverbs for the whole of this week come from the country of Libya. Massive country, fourth largest country on the continent. Yeah. But with a population of only 7 million. Only 7 million? Yep. Just the population of the whole country, just slightly more than the population of Nairobi. Slightly. Just slightly more. Okay. Yes. Its capital city, mm. Tripoli, has around one million people. That is the undisputed capital. <laughs> well, it's disputed. But now there's a ceasefire. Mm. The civil war that mm. has been raging since 2011 has ceased. Mm. So now there's normalcy of sorts. Okay. So people agree on some of these things. Now the proverb for the day. It came running and was met by a slope. It came running and was met by a slope. Yes. Avinda. That proverb. How do you understand it <laughs> and how do you interpret it? I think it looks like he's waiting for me to say more. And yes. that's it. The proverb is over. That's the it. The proverb is over. That's it. <laughs> that's it, I guess. <laughs> What's the interpretation of it? It came running and was met by a slope. I think it came running and met by a slope simply in, in terms of uh, how it has from where it came to where it's going. I think that's, that's basically what he's trying to say. Uh, you know, coming and then it can, the slope can either be very slippery, it's gone down very quickly or depending on the gradient of the slope. Mm. That's the way I take it. If it's somewhere in Elgeo, Marakwet and uh, Wasingishu counties, meets the slope and it flies. And it flies. Yeah, the, mm. <laughs> yeah, the slope can be going upwards or downwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sport there that uh, takes place in those ravines. So you come running and then you meet a slope and you take off. <laughs> Mm, paragliding. Paragliding. And then there's bungee diving. Why do people do such dangerous things? <coughs> hmm? Why not? See, Why not? What if that rope snaps? See, it snaps. What is the probability? That is what I would not like to test. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it, eh? <laughs> no. That probability, uh -uh. Uh, there are other ways of testing probabilities, and that has fatality written all over it. I think it's what gives you the adrenaline. Ah. You know, it's the adrenaline. Look at look at the just concluded WRC rally. You know, who would think somebody would be comfortable sitting in a, in a navigator's seat? Mm. You know, at when the when the driver is pushing it to 160, 170 kilometers per hour, are you comfortable? For, with some people, it gives you the oomph. It gives you a lot of adrenaline going in. Some people love that adventure. Same thing as, as the other side. Yes, yes, yes. I see my heart stopping. I see myself becoming an ancestor. <laughs> I, I would love to be there in, in, the, in, in that seat. Have you not been, Avinda? Well, I, I have been. Uh, I've never driven the car. But I've, I've, I've sat in the navigator's seat. Mm. Um, but the one thing is, yes, you trust your driver, and the driver needs to trust you. So that's the first thing. But mm. it's it, it's not adrenaline; it's also the passion. It, if you're a car lover and you love it and you love sitting in that seat, it's great. So it's what, fun. So what, in essence, you're saying that your being the MD of CFAO is not accidental. You are actually someone who's doing something they love. You you have to love. I think for every job that you need to be there, you need to love it. 
Uh, I mean, I mean, the big question remains is what wakes you up in the morning? Mm. I mean, do we just wake up like yourselves coming into this newsroom? You have to love it. Mm-hmm. You know? All pun intended, what drives you? <laughs> what drives you? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And pushing the limits. Right. And we need what, to push the limits. What does CFAO mean? What does it stand for? So CFAO means Corporation for Africa and Overseas. Um, this is this is basically the new company, and I want to give a little bit of a of a background. Mm. Way back in 2016, Toyota Tusho Corporation in Japan acquired 100% of CFAO, which was a French conglomerate, and uh, it decided to uh, integrate uh, the African operations into one in creating efficiencies within within the continent, not just in Kenya but obviously other parts of of uh, Africa. Mm. And here in Kenya, if I bring it down to the Kenyan context, I mean, under the CFAO Motors banner, there were basically four uh, companies, which was Toyota Kenya at that time, mm. which in February 2022, we changed our name from Toyota Kenya to CFAO Motors. Mm-hmm. And then there's the DT Dobi, or was the DT Dobi, and then there's another company called Loxia, which is an operating lease company. And then the last one is a tire distribution Africa, which is a joint venture between Michelin and CFAO. Mm-hmm. So we've got these four <coughs> companies. And then in April 2023, uh, this year, the two strongest, well-recognized, well-established companies, which was ex Kenya, CFAO, and DT Dobi came one, or yeah. became one, under the banner of CFAO, leveraging off obviously the benefits mm-hmm. which comes along with with being a bigger company mm-hmm. within within Kenya you know previously Toyota Kenya was if you thought of Toyota Kenya you'd think you're going you'll find Toyota Toyota vehicles Toyota motorbikes Toyota 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 DT Dobi on the other hand has different models of vehicles mm. now when you say that this is toyota susho that has then acquired cfao and then now we have dt Dobi, are we saying that that bigger company acquired these brands of vehicles as well no um you see the the merger that actually happened in 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 kenya was to leverage off the benefits uh, because CFAO was very strong in the western side, whereas Toyota Tusho Corporation was very strong in the eastern side of Africa. Yeah. So it is leveraging of the experience of CFAO mm-hmm. together with uh, the experience that Toyota Tusho Corporation has on the eastern side, mm-hmm. bringing the two together to actually create a, a, a better company mm-hmm. uh, within Kenya. How does, that, how does that benefit the industry or the market? Uh, well, you see... Because we want to take the multi-brand approach, so when you're saying Toyota, it's very and under. Let me give you an example. Under Toyota Kenya, we had Suzuki yeah. franchise. It is very. It was very difficult to start saying Suzuki sold by Toyota. Yeah. You know, it, um, I think we were confusing the customers, but now it's obviously we have eleven brands under the CFAO, yeah. which range from two wheelers, which is Yamaha, to the bigger trucks, the Mercedes trucks and the Sino trucks, which are there. So now it's very easy to say Toyota by CFAO, Suzuki by CFAO, Mercedes by CFAO. Mm. So that is how I think it benefits our consumers or customers. One, there is going to be no confusion. Secondly, we've got a big network uh, across the company. We've got 33 outlets. And um, you can go into each of these outlets, get the service, get the parts. So it's a one-stop shop mm. for us. I wonder, you call yourselves a mobility solutions provider. What is that? And then based on that, what does the market have to look forward to? Okay. In, in terms of mobility solution provider, it's like, like I've just said. One is we give you the benefit of coming to us, whether you, you know, like I could have a first car, which is a Mercedes, the second mm. car can be a Toyota, third car for my children can be a Suzuki, and maybe my youngsters can drive a, a Yamaha. Mm-hmm. So we have got the product offering that any individual household would need you can get it serviced anywhere over and above that what are your needs would like to meet your needs so do we really get to your needs uh, we are in the process of even introducing now the hybrid vehicles mm-hmm. you know we are looking and seeing how can we go carbon neutral mm. uh, we've just brought in the RAV4s which are HEVs 
in, in the country, which, as we all know, emit less, there's less emissions um, and, and more fuel economical, uh, you know, because it switches between battery and, and fuel. Mm -hmm. And with, with that in mind, um, we, we can become the solution provider that you really need. So from a product offering, from a service offering, and we'd like each and every customer to have a, a wow CFO experience. Yeah. You would love the CFO experience. You know, the, uh, I'm looking at uh, stories one reads of the stock market. I think you know where I'm going with this. Yes, Wall Street. And there's a law they call an antitrust law. When a company becomes, gets to a certain size, you have monopolistic tendencies. And so it is argued that it's not good for competition. But then there's the other dis uh, discussion around it. Diversity under one roof. There's no way where it says that just because there's diversity under one roof, there cannot be competition within the same group. What philosophy does CFO mm. subscribe to? I, I like that question because um, one thing is we, we, we make sure that there is internal competition. Mm. So the way we have set up our organization, because there is also OEM from an OEM perspective, mm. uh, you cannot just put everything into one and say everything is hunky dory. Okay? The way we have set up is we have one managing director managing it, that's myself, mm. and then we have three key main divisions. One division, which is the Toyota and Yamaha business, which is led by our deputy managing director, Joshua Anya. Uh, he will look only after Toyota and Yamaha. That's it. That's it. You know, his strategies will be around Toyota and Yamaha. Uh, we have another division which we call multi-brand and equipment. When we look at multi-brand, it will be all the other models that we sell from a passenger point of view, which is the Mercedes passenger cars, the VW and the Suzuki. Obviously, the customer base is very different. Mercedes being niche, uh, VW target market is different, and Suzuki obviously different. So, uh, the multi-brand equipment division is run by another managing director called Chris Ndala. So he's going to be managing that. And equipment business. Equipment, we're calling it equipment because it's the trucking division. So under the trucks, we've got the Hino, Sino, and Mercedes-Benz mm -hmm. uh, trucks. Now, Hino, we are, we are concentrating on medium-sized uh, trucks. Uh, Mercedes is mainly the prime movers and Sino the same. But they're obviously customer base is different. So that's the way we've structured. And... Between Joshua and Chris, I can tell you there's a lot of competition fighting for the same customer. <laughs> so obviously you want to enhance the customer experience. At the end of the day, it's the customers who are coming out and saying, look, well, we want to experience, excuse me, want to experience this, get, you know, in touch with different vehicles, one, two, three, four, five, whatever they may be. What are some ways in which now you're saying with this merger, with this coming together, that then the customer experience would then be so much more enhanced? What are some of those initiatives that you're going to go into? Yeah. You know, f before I go into the customer initiatives, mm. I, I want to start, what are we doing internally? Mm. Mm. So one of the key internal things we have done is because of these companies coming together, we need to have one culture. Mm. We, we have moved from maybe being 500 people and another company being 200 people into something now we are actually 750 mm. employees, 11 brands mm. uh, across. So we, we have now embarked on taking up a culture change management, uh, making sure that we can all have the same culture and believe in becoming one team. So our, our philosophy is having one team, one aim, and working for one country. So it's all about being one because those are going to be our real ambassadors. Then we're saying, okay, let's take it. If we can form this one team, or we can act like a one team, mm. then we can actually have the customer and be cus more customer focused and more customer oriented. With that, we are saying the quality of relationships is extremely important for us. Build the relationships with our customers. Because once we can be one team building relationships, you know, we can have conversations. You can come to me and say, Arvinda, what do we really need to do? I need a mm. car for my daughter. I need a, something for my son. I need for my wife. And we, we try and give you a solution, including a finance package, yep. you know, uh, for, for those or perhaps some terms to pay. Mm. Uh, or you want to trade in your vehicle. 
So all that comes in, that conversations. Once those conversations happen, it will lead to the quality of actions. And once we can act better, faster, with a little bit of more agility, we can obviously get the quality of results, which is going to be a win-win situation, both for shareholders, for customers, mm -hmm. for ourselves and everything. So that's, that's the philosophy. That's how I'd like to maybe answer that question. Yeah. So it's about the quality of one team leading into the quality of relationship, leading into quality of actions, creating yep. a win-win solution for all of us. Is there something for everybody? And that's a thing that, um, we, you know, looking at, you know, ve vehicle interest or what, the question is that is there a little bit of space for everybody or is it set up for, you know, certain parts of society? I'm hearing you say, you know, you could have a vehicle, you have solutions for your children, have solutions for your, your spouse, your partner, but then also looking at different, different strata in society. Is there something then for everybody? There, there is literally everything for everybody mm. because we are bringing in, introducing the entry level models. We are bringing in a lot of vehicles to, to target the B2C. Um, and one of the key things I'm trying to say is why should people buy used cars which are seven year old? Mm -hmm. Let's try and bring them into buying and purchasing new vehicles mm -hmm. by giving them a product that is well priced and including a warranty and a service plan, you know, for us. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we can actually move our, our nation forward. Of course, everybody you know? would like to buy a brand new zero kilometer mileage vehicle, but many people don't. What is the barrier to entry, in your opinion? Why can't more and more people stop importing seven-year-old vehicles and walk into CFAO mm. and drive off with a brand new car? I think, I think for me personally, it's the perceptions. It's, it's the perception that mm. uh, used is cheap. Uh, and obviously... Well, the new is expensive. <laughs> or, yeah, but I say new can be expensive. And yeah. then perhaps the the parity in terms of pricing mm. so what you'll be able to get as a brand new entry-level vehicle would probably get you a, a bigger vehicle in the use but that having said that yeah. uh, we forget as customers that this new vehicle comes with a warranty comes with a service plan mm. uh, which you will not get and some of the used cars that are brought in are they really authentic are they having genuine mileage uh, will you need to do a few things on it? Uh, remains questionable. Is that really the challenge, Avinda? Is it, is it because it sounds like a lack of awareness that if more and more people actually were aware and they did a comparison, so I have 1.5 million shillings, how much can I get for a used vehicle? And a 1.5 million shillings, if I walk to CFAO, what type of car would I drive out with? And what benefits do I get? Is that the lack of awareness? that really hinders people from purchasing brand new vehicles? I, I think it's a perception thing. Mm. I, I really think it's a perception thing. But then what also leads to it is how are we as a nation trying to emphasize or trying to bring in people to buying brand new vehicles? What kind, what are we leading to help grow the local industry? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know we, we've actually, as a motor, com motor industry, we've been working on the national automotive policy. Uh, which is currently, we have done it, it's been discussed at the ministry level, so it's it's now at the ministry level now to take it forward. Mm. At least with that one coming in, when you actually say, let's try and, uh, you know, reduce the age of the used cars coming in, it will actually grow our, our new car market, and then it will also give us the opportunity to bring in more and more use, uh, more and more uh, local assembly, help the local content business grow, because in terms of local assembly, we'll have uh, other companies which are going to grow together with us. Yeah. So what does this automotive policy have? Because, yes, we, we've, we've read about it. We've reported about it. It's been there. It's been a conversation that's been taking place for a while, but it's still a draft policy. What are the main things that it contains and proposes? Whether it's draft or not, I'm not sure, because uh, it's been approved at this moment, uh, and it, and it is actually in, in the process of being finalized into a bill. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the policy is more or less finalized. Mm -hmm. But what, what the whole policy is, is trying to create more emphasis on how do we try and manage or get more local assemblies going. It's all about the market. You know, any OEM will not invest in Kenya unless you can actually give volumes. 
It's all about volumes. And if we can actually promise our shareholders to come in and say, let's get more and more volumes, uh, we'll get the approvals to assemble more and more vehicles, which means, again, we, we create jobs. For us as CFAO, uh, we do local assembly on the Land Cruiser pickups. We started off with Hilux. We are doing the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the Matatus, the highest. Mm -hmm. we, we're currently doing that. And then on the multi-brand side, we're doing the VW side. We're doing the Mercedes truck side. Sino is being locally assembled. Hyundai is being locally assembled. And in July, I mean, we're already in July. Mm -hmm. So within this month, we are going to launch another model uh, at this moment i will not give it out i'll mm. say watch the space <laughs> <laughs> i'll say watch the space we are going to have another new model coming and and yeah we are geared towards growing and that will create more and more jobs and we as cfao um, are really geared towards growing because i believe we we believe in kenya we have the opportunity to grow there's a lot of potential so we we will actually continue investing and uh, and growing our uh, potential in in For Kenya the industry. Our guest this morning is Arvinda Singh Real. He is the managing director of CFAO Motors Kenya Limited. Well, we know them as you know former Toyota, former DT Dobi coming together. The tire distribution company uh, that was Michelin and Tidia and, and the Tidia and the Tidia and then there's the there's a leasing company as well. And we'll talk about leasing as well and how that is picking up in the market, CT. You know, there's a bit of a conundrum here. You see, Toyota, when it was just simply Toyota, mm. had this marketing messaging. The kind front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I decided to test it. It was actually true. I mean, every other place you went to, you would come across a Toyota. Mm. Nissan did their bit. The other vehicles did their bit. Now, when we then begin this discussion and bring in second-hand vehicle, <laughs> it's by the same manufacturer. Mm. It's not some other different manufacturer. Now, the basket is even bigger. Mm. There's been a talk from the previous century towards the end of it and then to this century, this subject of recycling. What do you do with the vehicles you've manufactured when they get old? Because you're always bringing in new ones, things which are more appropriate, which do better things than the previous ones. What do you do with the other vehicles? I mean, other people come and sell them because essentially you've created a job for other people. You've created a market, but at the same time you've created a competition for yourself. How do you find a middle ground here? Because in the absence of your production, the people who deal in second-hand vehicles don't have vehicles to sell at second-hand. You, have to, you, manufacturers, have to manufacture it before it becomes old and second-hand. Yeah, that, that's, an in, that's an interesting conversation. Uh, because when, when you look at, in, in Japan or, or anywhere else, what do they do with the, with the, with the used cars? You know, the, everybody's on a leasing model. Mm. You know, hardly do those first world countries buy cash. Everybody's on a leasing model. So once the lease lease is over, the vehicle is got back and they have to find the market somewhere else. Where are they really going to send those vehicles so that they don't have a problem? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then any country that doesn't have restrictions of importing those cars, those cars end up in those countries. And then it becomes their problem be frank mm. so so we are getting all the seven eight year old cars and then how long are those call it second customers or second tier customers uh, going to be using those vehicles and then where do they end up mm. okay. we do not have a disposal system within within Kenya to actually get rid of very old vehicles so some of them end up on, on stones because later on you will not be able to get uh, somebody to service them or somebody to even oh even the parts that come with it yeah so that's that's what end, ends up happening with these ones and then they will be probably scrap and we will sell them as a uh, scrap metal as an individual now scrap metal has a value has a value yes well, you know what I'm saying is 
I'm looking at this industry and I'm looking at how the push for innovation, which creates perhaps new markets, produces clearly new products. The thinking that goes into these new products is profound. Now surely, a little thinking as to what to do thereafter can't be that profound, can it? No, no, I, ideally, you, you know it's a whole cycle. Huh? Yes. It's a whole cycle. So the whole question is the, the, the metal that it, it's, it's scrap, mm. let me call it that way, scrap. Where does that go? Mm. It is re-exported, melted, and the whole recycle cycle be, yes. it, it begins again. It begins again. So nothing is a, is a waste, only apart from a few things which will be discarded and destroyed. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, it is a market that is self-regenerating. Um, yeah, possible to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you see where I'm going with this is, if that is the case, I am looking at the value of the vehicle when it gets to that point where it's going to be scrap metal smelted and turned into a product that will produce new cars. Okay? It has a value. I'm looking at the affordability of new vehicles in an economy like ours. And I'm looking at the concept of a trade-off. Trade-off as you mentioned, has to do with a vehicle that is actually moving and which you take. Now, this may not be your business because your business is clear. But I'm simply thinking, for a third world country, I visited a country called Malaysia. They claim to have a car that they produce called a Proton. Okay, German engineering, what have you. But it's everything is done there. Are we saying that as CFAO, you're thinking of getting to a position where something similar can actually happen here in Kenya. A car that is actually affordable for the Monangi. I think, I think what we need to do as CFAO, mm. is, uh, or as a motor industry, let me say, in Kenya, is to get an affordable car mm. Okay, to start off with. Mm. Not mm. by looking at what is the end process, but by beginning and saying what is the starting point for yeah. us. That's where we need to start with, mm -hmm. uh, because we are not in the in the business of trying to see what do we do at the end of cycle and and collecting scrap metal and sending it. We we not there are other people who actually that's, specializes that's in their that. business. So that's their business. Yes, I think we need to look at our value chain. But for us, bringing it down, how do we come up with that vehicle? And I think the only way to do that is how do we enhance the local production or the local assembly of those vehicles get supported uh, by incentives, taxes, duties uh, on, on those kind of vehicles together with the OEMs and develop the local content within the country. Mm. It's the only way to get it right. And it's a possibility. It is definitely a possibility. But again, economies of scale, it needs to come with volumes. Mm. Nobody is going to come in and invest on a on a on a vehicle that you say, okay, let's try and get a vehicle at the next price without the volumes. What sort of volumes are we talking about theoretically? If if we look at it from a from a annual basis, um, the the automotive market as a whole is roughly around thirteen thousand vehicles, out of which nearly fifty percent is truck and buses. Mm. So when you're looking at vehicles, we have got a market of only six thousand. Mm. But when we look at what is imported as grey imports in the country, it's anything between eighty thousand to a hundred thousand vehicles. Right. Yep. Annually. Mm. Annually. Right. Annually. And that's where the volumes come in. Mm. So if we can change the policies, um, get uh, the local industries more. Uh, vibrant, you know, to be able to assemble. That's the only way we will actually get the volume. So and the then volume, volume is there. The, the thing is, already, yeah. could how be there. The, to tap, how to tap on How it. to tap into yes. that volume. What would you consider an affordable vehicle for the Kenyan market? In, in terms of... Uh, you said it's important for this industry to actually start looking at how to bring a vehicle that's affordable. What is that? figure what's an affordable vehicle i i would i would say anything about between 1.5 to 1.8 million shillings okay. as a brand new vehicle as a brand new vehicle yes. fully loaded fully you know loaded called yes. fully loaded yeah because there are some then that are locally manufactured that yes you go and you find a fully lo locally manufactured vehicle going at around that range of 1.5 million shillings or thereabouts but then there are some things that are not uh, electric 
you have to wind up your own window you've got to adjust your own side mirror on the side it, I, I look on the side of the dashboard and the things that are not there you don't have a stereo system you've got to think of fixing your own stereo system maybe that is what is pushing people away from just not coming from the 80,000 people to join the 6,000 but but you know coming up with a car of let's say I, I want to call it 1.8 million yeah there will be certain I'm not saying major but there will be certain compromise that will need to be made it will definitely come with a with a stereo which will be the top notch there's there's no i don't think so there's a problem there okay. um it will come with a wind up you know electronic wind ups for for the for the mirrors um maybe maybe the rear will be a a winder i'm, I'm not too sure what what may be there but we need to spec it so there'll be a there'll be some trade-offs there will be some definitely some trade-off and this is a 1.5 million shilling vehicle 1.8 let's say 1.8 1.8 million shilling what vehicle. do we need to do to make a 1.8 we, we, million as shilling CFO, vehicle we actually have Good. it mm. mm -hmm. we have it so so our vw polo that that we are currently offering is is within the range yeah mm. and and i believe it's locally assembled um and we are able to get it uh, to the one inches at, at that particular price mm -hmm. it's the one i'm talking about i've actually even driven one here and my colleague saw it but the the rear you you know you have to do the winding up yourself what do we need to do to make sure those rear v uh, windows are also electric yeah and then more needs to be done for the same price range because you see what i'm saying is people will go to the market they'll compare that with something else at 1.8 million shillings yes it's a second hand vehicle but what they're importing is has everything has all this it's only that 30,000 kilometers versus zero kilometers mm. the the only thing is I, I would actually bring it down again to volumes and and for us to have that discussions with the oems yeah. uh, means that we say okay give us these extras in the vehicles mm -hmm and we promise you that we will get to so much of volumes we guarantee the numbers, we, we guarantee the numbers. Right. Okay. and once we guarantee the numbers then we can actually negotiate for better pricing mm. on on the kits because they're locally assembled mm. and once we can do that yes then i think we can we can actually better spec them mm. so it's the chicken or egg story it's really the the volumes versus the pricing mm. yeah and that that can only happen again once i say is we really look into uh, perhaps reducing the age of the used vehicles um, and the incentives that come together with the localization. Mm. If you take all those things and put them into consideration, then would you say that there is a case then can be that can be made for people to start to to then purchase new vehicles as opposed to importing older vehicles if these things are done and looking at what the market already says well i'm going to import a, a vehicle that's six seven years old because number one it's cheaper everything that i can do you know everything that i need is in the vehicle and it comes already um pre-packaged but here we are saying that you can actually buy a new vehicle maybe a little bit more and you don't have to deal with all these other things so is there a case to be made for purchase of new vehicles in kenya today with what you've just said of vehicles being available if we can guarantee the numbers definitely mm. definitely yes mm. and and that's and that's ex exactly what we're working with yeah uh, and we're actually working towards that because i believe on the commercial side we are there mm. Mm. if you look at the commercial and the pickup side um, the trucks it, it's available mm. the truck side it's available it's mm. locally assembled the the vehicle uh, the the pickup segment is locally assembled and, yeah. and it's available mm. it's only where we have not gone is on the passenger side mm. yeah um, and that's because again how do we guarantee the volumes okay one of the biggest partners that your organization has I believe is the government I worked for a government parastatal so and I oversaw the buying of vehicles. So I understand one of the things that, and this was Toyota Kenya, okay? Now, this is probably a purely marketing uh, process, but I am looking at the fondness Kenyans have for grouping themselves into circles and all sorts of organizations. It's, it's a growth industry here. There's two people, the register group and you're something. Now, if I look at our constantly growing population, Yes, the numbers alone in terms of people, one could look and say, yes, 
that volume you're seeking could actually be found. But how do you tap into it? And this is where now these groupings that I'm talking about come into being. How do you relate to all these other organizations who have people, where people put their money together, and who in and of themselves would offer some sort of guarantee because it is their members? Because many of these people take car loans, but they're supported by the institutions, the circles that they belong to. How friendly or how switched on are your people when it comes to this process of selling the idea of a new car to all these Kenyans who know and understand that buying a car of necessity is buying a used car. In fact, you don't even think of buying a new car. So, so let, me, let me give you uh, an example, an interesting one. Mm. Because what you're saying is tapping into the B2C market. The B2C? The consumer. Business to con customer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, because if you look at government is government, mm. B two business to business, which is B two B, you know that's where the sacos exist. Yep. It is not the sacos have not been brought down to an individual level. I mean, if I was to ask you, do you belong to a saco or an institution or a grouping? Yep. that actually talks about cars and gives loans within your grouping? I think the answer is no. We've not developed that, and we, I don't think so that will ever come into being. No, they offer all sorts of loans, and among yes. the loans they offer so, is for a car. But generally, they offer that to the Matatu Sakos mm. and no, commercials. No, this is what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Not necessarily. I'm saying because I know I belong to a Sako, and they actually offer you a facility to buy a vehicle. Just like they offer you a facility to buy a house, if you so wish. So, okay, I understand what you're saying now. In, in terms of those, those suckers, we're already in, in contact with them. Okay. We have actually given them specific model lineup, uh, marketing material. We are attending their AGMs. Uh, we actually give them test drives vehicle including all the committees, the chairmen, so that they can actually market it to their uh, members. members. Mm -hmm. uh, over and above special pricing, we can even arrange some financing for them in case they do not have enough within their SACOs. Um, so all that is already being done. Okay. Yeah. I'm leading somewhere here. There, is a, there, there exists a group of Kenyans who at this point in time don't have money, don't earn, but they could earn in the future. The people in our colleges, the people in our universities. Now, do your people have a plan? Do you have a plan where you talk to such people so that by the time they're in a position to earn, they already sold to the idea of buying a new car because you've inducted them and shown them how they can go about it? Already in the plan. Yeah, we, you yes. guys think ahead. Eh? Yes, already in the plan. Mm. Um, and this is already being done. And I'll, I'll give you a very interesting example uh, of myself, mm. which is a, far from the automotive industry. You know, when I was growing up, mm. there was an ice cream shop. My father always used to take me to this ice cream shop. Here in Nairobi? Here in Nairobi, in town. On Windy uh, Bingo Street. Uh, we will not mention that. <laughs> Wait a moment. Uh, everybody, if that's, that's the one, everyone went there. Everybody knows that so, ice cream shop. So every time I went to that ice cream shop, yes. The, the owner of the ice cream shop, obviously all the adults would have, and we were the kids, mm. you know, 10 year, 11 year old kids. And he would actually give us a baby corn, what they call a baby mm -hmm. corn. Yes. Mm. Just fill it in and say here. And every time my dad asked him how much for this corn, he says, no problem. It's, it's on me. Yes. And he kept on asking why. He said, they are going to be my future customers. <laughs> and to date, I can tell you, I, I actually take my kids to that, to that shop as mm. well. But... In the same way, coming back to us, we are already looking and seeing in the universities, yep. um, in, in the technical colleges, in this, who are going to be our future customers. Okay. Okay. What kind of vehicles would be a starting point? What kind of profiling would this be? There will be the doctors, the engineers, the architects, and so on and so forth. Mm. So that is already in the pipeline. Now, as CFAO, as you, you mentioned, one of the things that you have to really think about is how to address the customer's needs, how to meet the customer at their 
closest to them as possible. There is distributorship then and also service stations. Now, tell us about your distributorship network and your service network across the country. Now, as this combined conglomerate of CFAO, of course, we know DTW had its own, Toyota Kenya had their own. How are you merging them? And particularly when you talk about now new vehicle purchasers and institutions such as government that are leasing from you. Yeah. So, so from our from from our point of view, like I said, we have got now 33 outlets. We are going to grow them to, let's say, 46 in the next two years. Mm. But what we have done now, so that we do not the customers know exactly where to go. We don't want to change everything right now. So the Mercedes customers who used to go on to Lusaka Road to get their vehicles serviced know that they will still be going on to. Lusaka Road. Yeah. The Toyota customers who come to Huru Highway Branch or Westlands Branch will continue growing. So we've dis, uh, we made this decision from a customer point of view, so that we don't say, okay, when a customer pitches up to Lusaka Road, please go to Gong Road, yeah. for example. But what we have also done is to say, okay, where do our customers stay? Profiling, you know, uh, these customers and saying, what is the nearest facility they could actually go to. Mm -hmm. So if we say, let's say it's in Gong Road, uh, then can we introduce certain models and and create some of the technicians or base for that particular uh, models. Mm -hmm. So what we are trying to do is to move from a single uh, brand facility to a multi-brand facility. Mm -hmm. And that's happening <coughs> across the com uh, country, mm -hmm. including Lodwa. Okay. Lodwa. Yeah, we we have a we have a branch in Lodwa, our own owned branch in Lodwa. The Toyota, uh, the Toyota branch. Yes, it's a it's a it's yes. a CFAO branch CFA. now. So now it's a yeah. CFAO branch. Yeah. So but obviously we may not have a Mercedes passenger cars in in Lodwa, mm. but um, some some other models will will, will be, definitely will be there. Be, it will be there. Okay, so there's a Toyota Foundation which still exists. Yes. What kind of work then are you doing, or under? the Toyota Foundation still as part of as, as CFAO? Okay. Um, the Toyota Foundation is really part of part of the group. Mm. Okay. It was uh, managed. I'm, I'm, I happen to be one of the trustees. So that Toyota, it's still th called Toyota Kenya Foundation. Mm. Mm. And we actually sponsor students uh, for their uh, tertiary education and develop them up to the university level. Uh, they, the foundation owns uh, three properties from where it actually gets rental income and the rental income is used to fund the operations. But over and above that, uh, we continue as CFA Motors to support the foundation mm -hmm. in achieving those uh, motives. Over and above, you know, you're talking about the foundation, mm -hmm. but we've also got the Toyota Kenya Academy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Toyota Academy is actually based here in Popo Road. Mm -hmm. um, so... This one is, is actually uh, training all our technician, blue collar jobs, but not just for automotive, but also non-automotive. Mm. So we are partnering with people like JICA and, and the rest of them to actually train and develop our, our young Kenyans. And is there an aspect of this training that focuses on areas where people are disadvantaged? Yes, definitely. Mm. Areas of uh, disadvantage and also we are quite diverse in, in the people that are coming in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just uh, anybody, uh, but we, we try to to actually bring in people who still have some kind of maybe some disabilities, but have the entrepreneurship uh, skills. Mm -hmm. We're actually giving them entrepreneurship skills so that they can start up their own businesses in future. Uh, Toyota Garages, if I may just speak about Toyota, mm -hmm. my understanding of them was they had some grading, meaning there's a certain tier, there, there, there are certain guarantees that certain garages could give you. Like, say, Kericho Toyota. Mm -hmm. It had a, a higher grade. If I'm, I'm using a, a loose term. Mm. Are you going to maintain that with the other facilities for servicing of vehicles? I, I want to believe that at any of these outlets that we have, specifically for Toyota that you have, all their technicians have gone through... Uh, the same training, yeah. either through the Toyota Aca uh, Academy, Academy as well as the training that is offered by our national service team to, to all of them. So there's a pro there's a, a pro tech, there's a master technician, mm -hmm. and each of these dealership must have a certain level of uh, those kind of technicians to be able to give the kind of service that's required. Right. You know, 
Uh, so there's uniformity. Guarantees. There's uniformity across when you go in mm. terms of the level of service and the and the quality of service that you will actually uh, get from the customers. Okay. Avinda, thank you very much for joining us. Asante Sana, it's a pleasure being here today and thank you very much for having me on the show. Come again soon. Really Avinda Singh Real is the Managing Director, CFAO Motors Kenya Limited. We've been talking about the future of the automotive industry in the country. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.